You are listening to TMB DOS. They must be destroyed on sight. Discussions of an adult nature, adult language, and spoilers for the films discussed are most likely. Still on board? Come on in. Enjoy your stay. Destroyed on sight. Okay, we're back. It's They Must Be Destroyed on Sight, episode 118, and I'm your host, Lee. Your mother mates out of season, Russell. And I'm joined by my co-host, Daniel. More potent than any human drug you can imagine, Harper. How are you doing, sir? I'm doing quite well, and are you trying to reference my sexual prowess, or just the experience of listening to me on a microphone? It could be just smelling you, as far as I know. Oh, well. Either way, whatever aspect you want to take from that, that's fine, you know. It's open to interpretation. So, I do often have otter fur in my teeth, if that helps. So, <laughs> your 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 beard may be more, more potent than any, any human drug you can imagine. So, that is that is one of those things. I get it. Yeah. <laughs> so we're gonna be continuing our little uh, mostly eighties uh, sci fi series here, and we're gonna be looking at Alien Nation from nineteen eighty eight. But before we do that, we do have a few comments to get to. Two of the comments we're going to leave till the end from Court Psyops and Darren Wilson of respectively the Cinema Psyops podcast and the Psychosomata podcast or Psychosomata cast or however you want to say it. He doesn't even know. But we do have two other comments here on a couple of our YouTube versions of our podcast. First one is for our Repo Man episode, and this is from Painted Pony Films. He says, this movie is the bomb. Is the flying car a throwback to heavy metal from 1981 he says probably alex cox is tapping into everything trippy movie until right now i didn't remember if there was a flying car in uh the animated uh heavy metal movie from 1981 have you ever seen that daniel that movie i don't think i've seen it all the way through i know i used to um sell the uh the comic when i was Mm -hmm. uh when i worked i worked at a bookstore for a while and we did the magazines i was the, the kind of the magazine stock guy and uh, so I used to stock the heavy metal and then you come to like the plastic. And then like when you, you know, you take the old ones off the shelf and you put them in a box and then so I'd sometimes like cut them open and then like look through it and then, you know, get rid of it. So right. I mean, that's kind of my great familiarity with the heavy metal magazine, at least. Um, and I know I've seen at least kind of part of the film. I don't think I've actually seen the whole thing, um, but that should that should probably go on our list. I think that's worth a worth a visit at some point. I, I believe it is. Yeah, actually, um, that's one I've been thinking about putting on the list uh, to do. We should I do, really do some more animated films. I know we were talking at one point about doing some of the Batman, the animated Batman films, right. and the animated Justice League films. So, yeah, we should just do like an animated month or something at some point. Yeah, just you know, be good. try some stuff. But uh, yeah, I, I seem to recall there is a flying car in that movie, and hey, Alex Cox might have been uh, tapping into that. You never know. Heavy metal seems like something he might have been uh, reading at the time because it was kind of a, at the time, was kind of a counterculture sort of uh, sci fi magazine with lots of sex and violence and stuff in it yeah. at the same time. So, yeah, yeah it, it wouldn't surprise me at all if, if he was, if he was drawing from that, at least the same well of inspiration, if not, you know, literally kind of ripped it off from, of a, uh, Heavy metal. So. Right. And the other comment we'll get to right now is from someone named John Doe. Uh, I assume that's not their real name. And um, everybody assumes that, but I bet that guy is really upset every time. Like, no, that's the name I was given. <laughs> Fuck you. It's like yeah. all these fucking people. Um, I hate my parents. But he made a comment on our uh, Violent City Revolver episode on YouTube. The YouTube going back a bit. Of, yeah, going awesome. back a little bit. And here's his comment. Who are these fuckers? Why don't they shut the fuck up? I want to watch the movie, not listen to two assholes whom I know nothing about talking about nothing I've ever heard of. (laughs) I assume this is one of these people who searched for like violent city in YouTube and thought, oh, here's the movie because our ep- some of our episodes run as long or longer than the movies we're talking about. So right, right, right. because uh, our, our cheerleaders episode, 
uh, on YouTube that has thousands upon thousands of fucking watches. And you know why? Because everyone's oh, the movie's online. I'm gonna get and, it. And every everybody or, or anybody who Google's cheerleaders suddenly gets you know. Uh-huh. And the and the average engagement rate is something like four seconds before they realize, oh, this isn't the actual thing that I thought yeah. I was googling. Yeah, this is significantly harder to masturbate to than the thing I thought I was uh, picking up. <laughs> yeah, I get it. I mean, uh, not not really worth responding. Except like I don't understand why you comment yeah you know you really oh this isn't the thing i thought it was i mean it's not even like we're one of those scam where like oh go click here and you can see the movie sort of you know thing. Yeah. no we're just it's just a podcast about the movie yeah. i don't understand how you click on it and then like take the time to comment i bet because you know like move on like oh they, this isn't the thing i was looking for but this guy must have had his fucking dick already in his hand ready and he was clicking yeah. on the fucking video and, I was yeah. I was de- I was defending the guy's name. I was even gonna I was even gonna be kind to him, and then he was he was a dick to me, and mm-hmm. uh, I feel I feel slightly put off by that. The internet, yeah. the internet has been unkind, and that's not something I expect. Yeah, <laughs> I'm glad you got bo- uh, blue balls, John Doe. Go fuck yourself. Yeah, yeah so we'll move on. Uh, like I said, we'll get to uh, court. So and I, assume, Darren... I assume we have two relevant comments that we'll get to at the end. Is that yeah? The issue? Okay. They're and they're 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 more better safe for the end of the uh, podcast too. So uh, we'll 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 get back to court and Darren's comments then. Switching and... up the switching up the format a little bit here on me. I I didn't expect this. You know, well, well actually they... planning the episode out <laughs> in front of us. Well, it's not like I so much planned it as this, I read their comments and I was like, ah, these comments are better answered by the end of it once we've talked about the movie. So sure. um, <laughs> we'll move on now to what we've watched in the last little while. And I'll just go first and say um, I recently did a DVD purchase, uh, recent purchases video on the YouTube side of things. And I posted a link to that. In our Facebook group, they must be destroyed on Facebook, the single best place to get in touch with us and find out what's going on in the podcast. And uh, as well, uh, I've been linking a lot of Paul's recent uh, sort of purchase, movie purchases and stuff that he also does videos for. And I have all those helpfully linked under my video. So you can watch my video and you can watch all Paul's videos and you can see what we've purchased in the last little while. And I talk about a couple of the ones that I've watched that I've... um, purchase so far and what I thought of them. So uh, you can check that out there. And I'll provide the link, of course, in the show notes for this. We'll just move over to Daniel, what you've watched in the last little while. Sure, I got two things. Um, well, you'll see when we get there. Uh, I did watch The Love Witch. Uh, this okay. is from 2016 or 2015, I think. Yeah. Um, this is pretty interesting. Basically, this is a film that... It's sort of imagine Jess Franco hadn't existed, but mm-hmm. like someone else making films in that same genre who had never seen a Jess Franco film mm-hmm. would would do. Interestingly, I've seen some interviews with the um, kind of a writer director who doesn't like doesn't think of this as a sexploitation film, and it, in a lot of ways it isn't. It's just sort of like kind of borrowing from some of those tropes. She doesn't, she doesn't seem to really know the genre. Doesn't really no, know she the doesn't. Era. But it's kind of coming. Have you seen the film? I have seen the film, yeah. Okay. What do you think of it? I like it a lot. I think it does a good job of interweaving its sort of sexual politics and then at the same time still making like a really just interesting movie to watch. Yeah. And I mean, she did everything in this movie. You got to give her a lot oh, of credit. Yeah. Like she, she did all the costumes. She even acts in it. Amazing piece of work. And it, it really does sort of recreate... Not even necessarily uh, just Franco films, but the kind of stuff that Franco and like uh, Russ Russ Meyer, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, sort of sort of in that sort of uh, field. Like they're the obvious names, but there's a lot of other people doing this stuff, and it's it's almost kind of like um, it's kind the- of encapsulating an era. It's kind of like recapturing this particular moment in cinema. Yeah. And trying to kind of do something original within that era. At first, I thought the film was just set in 1969, but then as you as you kind of get on, like I mean, it does it does. Yeah, there's uh, there's some modern, modern technology in it, yeah. and you know, you get some like cell phones and stuff, and so it does sort of, sort of seem to be sort of divorced from time in a way, and and yeah. interestingly, and I feel like maybe it's trying to do something. I also feel like it's maybe a little bit obtuse and and kind of like I don't really get what she's trying to get at with the film 
Mm-hmm. Um, I think it might be worth a revisit at some point. I also think that, you know, from, you know, reading uh, kind of an interview with her where she kind of talks about, oh, no, because at first I thought this is somebody who just had a deep love for these kinds of films and who was kind of doing her version. And then you kind of realize, no, she doesn't like she kind of yeah, fell in love with the aesthetic, but she really doesn't know anything about the genre at all, which is fine. But you do kind of get the sense that, uh, you know, she she did one on this uh, Twitter thread, uh, this kind of uh, shit fit where, uh, you know, apparently a bunch of the crew didn't really like her. I mean, I, I, I kind of get the feeling she's a little bit insufferable. Um, yeah. And she's uh, dating this uh, dude who uh, wrote these like business books about the uh, 50th law and that sort of thing. So um, yeah. it, you do kind of get the sense of like, oh, this is one of those kind of wealthy New York City, you know, I've, types who... I've seen interviews from her where it's quite clear that she doesn't quite get the genre she's pulling from and she has no respect for the f- other films in it. And I mean, you know, there's, there's a lot of abhorrent things in Franco films and in yeah, Russ yeah. Meyer films, but she kind of just across the board shits on all of them. Like she actually hates that her movies are, com- that that movie is compared to those movies. Right. I so, mean, I, I, I get, I get, you know, thinking, Oh, Vampiros yeah. Lesbos is a, you know, I mean, really it's just, you know, you look at the actress, the lead actress in this, and she's just the spitting image of Soledad Miranda. Yeah. And uh, for me, and, and I mean, in with no insult to either actress, honestly, I mean, it's just, it's very like this almost reinvigorated spirit. And to me, it's the better comparison is she killed in ecstasy. Um, I think, I think it makes a lot more sense as a, as a comparison point than Vampiros Lesbos. Although I think, more people have seen Vampiros Lesbos, which isn't necessarily saying yeah. anything. <laughs> uh, you know, <laughs> um, 50 people have seen those films these days. But Love Witch is worth seeing. I think it's an interesting yeah. film. I'll definitely be revis- revisiting it. But it was not quite as strong as, as I was hoping it would be. Mm-hmm. Um, I have been uh, trying to seek out her first film, Viva. Oh. It is on Rare Lust, but the Rare Lust link is broken. So oh. I need to uh, contact the runner of uh, Rare Lust and let them know that uh, uh, Rare Lust is very, very receptive to that stuff too. Yeah, so yeah. yeah, so yeah, so I've been trying to do that. Maybe we'll uh, put that on the list to, to cover at some point because I think we both like uh, the Love Witch, and I think it would be worth uh, maybe uh, checking it out and doing it together. Yeah. Maybe for the sex comedy series. <laughs> <laughs> this one isn't quite the sex comedy that. Uh... <laughs> no, no, it's, it's. I mean, although it although it fits pretty well in that. I mean, at first you kind of think like it. It might be kind of this sort of Austin Powers type spoof sort of thing. Yeah. I mean, it's sort of. I don't know. It's it's almost. I don't really want to talk too much about it. I want people to kind of find it on their own and visit it. And um, but it's definitely uh, there, there's definitely a lot going on, and it's I think it's worth consideration, and it's definitely worth a watch, even though I don't find it. I mean, this is kind of not like I was really thinking this was going to be a home run, and it's kind of more of a like a three star kind of movie, two and a half mm-hmm. star kind of movie for me. You know, it's it's kind of a a weak thumbs up, but still a thumbs up. You know. Yeah. Yeah. The other thing that I watched, and uh, this was something that um, so. <laughs> The uh, there's a YouTube Red series called Cobra Kai, which is uh, all right. Thing, the Karate Kid series, and uh, Ralph Macchio and uh, what's his name, William Zebka, have uh, have returned to the series. And uh, I was uh, kind of idly chatting with my wife, and I realized that despite the fact that she's married to me and a reasonable human being who was alive in the '80s, had never seen any of the original Karate Kid films. <laughs> and I said, "Well, this is something that we need to." Um, uh, this is something we need to we need to fix. <laughs> so over the course of the last week, we've seen um, we have uh, we have rewatched. I have rewatched, and she has seen now the three Ralph Macchio Karate Kid films. They hold up much better than you might think they would. I kind of grew up on certainly the first three. Um, I've actually never seen the next was, Karate Kid, which is the Hillary Swank one, right? And I'm then there's a, the the Jaden Smith with Jaden Smith and Jackie Chan, yeah. which. Jackie Chan as Mr. Miyagi is kind of worth the price of admission. On a, you know, I'm, I'm, kind of, I'm, interested, I'm interested in seeing that, at least to see if it is going to be awful. But I will say that the Ralph Macchio, that trilogy, I was kind of expecting it to be shit, and it was definitely not shit. There is there's some really fun stuff in that, in particular with the relationship between Pat Morita and um, Ralph Macchio. Mm-hmm. Is, uh, Daniel LaRusso. Daniel Dennis Sutton. Sutton. And don't you think I heard that a billion times growing up? Yeah. I even took karate for a while when I was a kid. Um, oh, yeah. Partly, partly in, in uh, you know, response to this movie, as many kids in the, many suburban kids in the 80s did. Um, 
No, I uh, revisiting it, it again. It was it, they hold up a lot better than I thought they would. It was a lot of fun. I love the relationship between those two characters. I love uh, Machio's performance. Mm-hmm. I think he's legitimate. Like he legitimately feels like this, you know, fifteen year old kid who's just kind of a dweeb and kind of befriends this this old guy who's a handyman and then learns karate. And all of the films, like on paper, you're like, you know, because the, these films are like an hour and fifty minutes long. I mean, they're long films. Yeah, and yet they don't feel that long. I mean, and there's some really interesting kind of political stuff going on. I don't know. Like these these films are are definitely if you haven't watched them recently and you're kind of a fan of this podcast i think it might be worth revisiting them especially if you kind of grew up with them the way i did they hold they held up a lot better than i thought they would um there's still some kind of embarrassing stuff particularly the third one i mean they do kind of one is quite good too it's just kind of interesting because they actually go to okinawa right and, you know it's kind of got this whole other plot kind of happening and it's uh, not nearly as appropriative and not nearly as kind of like i mean i was expecting like really heavy shitty racism and it's not <laughs> like there's not some kind of period 80s racism going on uh, i'm not gonna pretend that that's not happening but it's much more respectful than i thought it was going to be and then the third one the third one is definitely a little bit more of a cash grab it feels like a little bit more of a yeah, we're going to kind of do the generic plot and we're going to just kind of revisit these characters one more time. But there's still there's still a lot of stuff to like in that. So they do kind of go downhill as the as the series right. progresses. Where one and two, one is quite good, two is good, and then three is, eh, it's okay. It's got some good stuff in it. So definitely rewatch the first one. That's kind of where I'm going. Yeah, uh, I haven't seen any of those movies since... I saw part one and part two. And I watched a bit of the uh, Jaden Smith one and well i hate that kid so <laughs> even jackie chan couldn't make that bearable so i, I turned that's, that off that's fair i mean the one thing that um i mean this is something my wife and i were talking about is like they're never going to really capture the spirit of the original with the jaden smith remake just on the jaden smith is never going to come across like a geek the way that you know ralph macchio ralph macchio is is legitimately able to kind of capture this he's kind of a an awkward gangly kid, you know, mm-hmm. and, um, you know, you really buy that relationship. I mean, there's a reason I mean, Pat Morita was nominated for an Oscar for the first karate kid film and for best supporting actor. And that's kind of remarkable. Like that's an amazing <laughs> thing that, you know, this little teenage coming of age story, you know, yeah. it's kind of this goofy piece of eighties <laughs> paraphernalia has an Oscar nomination. You know? And now in and now in 2018, that that uh, that relationship becomes much more suspect, and it might not win an Oscar. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's, but it it actually it actually kind of works. Uh, it's tough in 2018 to not kind of treat that as slightly uh, much more morally ambiguous. Except that again, the performances really do sell it, and this relationship between these two guys. I mean. I kind of remembered it just for the sort of, you know, the karate action, you know, and there's, there is a lot of that, but there's not, there's not that much of it in the films. I mean, it's really yeah. about just this kind of friendship between these. It's, it does kind of become a, a father son, you know, kind of relationship. I mean, a you know, a kind of teacher student. I mean, right. and, and it's, you know, it's a cliche and it, and it is filled with, I mean, a lot of the, you know, Asian mysticism kind of stuff. I mean, there is, there, there there's a heavy, heavy dose of that, but, um, Somehow the films actually work just by being pretty well written, actually quite well written for what they are. Well directed by John Avildsen, who also directed uh, Rocky, right. and um, and just exceptionally well acted. I mean, it really is just one of those things where those two actors in that particular circumstance, at that particular moment in the eighties, it just worked. And um, yeah, definitely worth a revisit. Cool, cool. Yeah, so uh, we'll take a very quick break here and uh, play some trailers for some uh, podcasts that we listen to and maybe a bit of music, and we'll be back to talk about Alien Nation. Badasses, Boobs, and Body Counts is a weekly podcast that discusses all things Grindhouse, Exploitation, Drive-In, and B-Movies. Your three hosts, Mike. We're, we're going to discuss the Rene Martinez-directed picture, the $6,000. What? Time, Wait, whoa, whoa, whoa. That's the name of the Super movie. Super Soul that's, Brother. That's the name. When you that's start look the movie. Your DVD cover. When you start the movie, the first thing that comes up says. is the title, and it says $6,000. $6, Mark and I've been around a girl stroking a horse's dick. Somehow, somewhere down the line, I'm going to use that clip against you. Shh. 
<laughs> do it. Please do. And listener favorite, Iris. The deployment sock. And I'm like, deployment sock? What the fuck is a deployment sock? He goes, you know, you know that sock that you just use? Oh my God, you guys are so gross. I come my depl- <laughs> See, so it happens for real. People do come inside. We'll make you question your political correctness while laughing at theirs. Episodes drop Sunday and can be found by searching for BB and BC Podcast via iTunes, Lipson, Stitcher, Google Play Music, and everywhere else you can download quality podcasts from. You can also listen to episodes directly from the show's website at bbnbcpodcast.com. This is a distress call from across time and space. I am Babs the automated biological support system for the humanoid known as the Witch. Witch vs. the Doomsday Clock is the weekly chronicle of his fight for survival and entertainment on the junk heap of the future. Episodes are transmitted in 15 minute pulses across the dimensional divide weekly for your listening pleasure. As you will learn, the future is not set in stone, and a flux capacitor is a girl's best friend. You can find us on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, SoundCloud, TuneIn, and on your Android device. Come join the rest of the Meat Popsicles in our Facebook group, facebook.com slash groups slash witch vs the doomsday clock. The replicant known as witch can be found on Twitter, Facebook, Tumblr and Instagram by searching for T-H-E-W-Y-C-H. The Witch vs the Doomsday Clock is a proud member of the Legion Podcast Network. Now in the words of Lord Humongous. Just walk away, and there will be an end to the horror. We're going to be talking about Alien Nation 1988. The newcomers have arrived. They have their own customs, their own mysteries. Slag town, I hate this place. And their own crimes. My fellow newcomers will work very hard to make as much money as they can to give to me. Sykes, here's your new partner. My true name is Stangia Sorens A. Well, gesundheit. Now, James Kahn. So what do you got? This will stop anything. And 
Mandy Patinkin are headed deep into newcomer territory. Get the ass, the guy. Your mother mates out of season. Into the heart of a mystery. Inside an alien world of violence. Desire. Tell me the truth. Have you ever made it with one of us? <laughs> and power. A sweet indulgence from our past. Resurrected for our future. It is called Jabluka. Your people do not know about this part of our past. Beyond their darkest fears. He's dead. No, he's not. Lies an evil beyond imagination. Alien Nation. Directed by Graham Baker. Written by Rockney S. O'Bannon. I guess I'm pronouncing that correctly. Rockney, I guess. Sure. Um, yeah, sure. Whatever. Uh, I don't think he wrote it, wrote anything else. So who cares? Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, he was, I mean, I'm oh, just, no, he, he, was, he, he was, he was five? Babylon five sequest right. defiance far state. Holy shit. Like this is, this is, I mean, he basically went on to TV and made it like this giant, brilliant career on TV. Yeah. I just remembered that. So, almost, uh, almost as if this property Made a lot more sense and not as a feature film. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, I'm not. I don't want to get ahead of ourselves, but it's almost as if maybe a feature film was not the the way to go with this. Yeah, I, I apologize, Rockney. Yeah, uh, I, I, I totally blame. We will say. I actually, yeah, I actually had this in my brain like two weeks ago, but uh, I forgot it. <laughs> yeah, I think so. So I have to apologize. Uh, we do record late at night, and I did the thing of saying. I'm going to take a little nap before we record so that I will be like fresh and invigorated. And I do that fairly regularly for this podcast. See, there's a three step process you have to go into. If you're going to do this one, you have to set your alarm. (laughs) Two, You have to turn on your alarm. (laughs) Yeah. And three, you have to get up when the alarm goes off. I set the alarm did not turn it on or actually I turned on an alarm, but I turned on the seven 30 in the morning and not the like 10 45 one. So uh, <laughs> I woke up at like one fifteen and went like, Oh shit. And Lee had already given up on me and had uh, decided he was not going to record the podcast with me that night. Otherwise you would have gotten this episode two weeks ago and we both would have been much more on our game because I think we both like kind of mainlined it and were ready to, to record that night. And uh, it was completely my fuck up for uh, setting the alarm wrong. Yeah, it happens. Anyway, so, we should go on with the uh, with the with the details on the film. Yeah, cast list: James Caan as Matthew, Matt Sykes, Mandy Patinkin as Sam, George, Francisco, Terrence Stamp as William Harcourt, Kevin Major Howard as Rudyard Kipling or Rudyard Kipling. I could never pronounce that fucking name. Most of these aliens' names are taken from historical figures, by the way. Leslie Beavis uh, from Spaceballs fame as commander at Zircon uh, as Cassandra. Uh, Peter Jason. Ah, Peter Jason, who also starred in um, They Live in 1988 as well. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Character actor frequently used by John Carpenter as Fedorchuk. Tony Perez as El Terez. Jeff Kober as Joshua Strader. Uh, Keon Young as Winter. Brian Thompson, who's a pretty noticeable uh, character actor. He plays a lot of heavies and lots of TV and movies as Trent Porter and Francis X McCarthy as Captain Warner. And I'll go quickly to a little synopsis here from someone called Jonathan Broxton on IMDb. It says a few years from now, Earth will have the first contact with an alien civilization. These aliens, known as newcomers, slowly begin to be integrated into human society after years of quarantine, but are victims of a new type of discrimination. When the first newcomer police officer, San Francisco, is assigned his new partner, he's given Matthew Sykes, a mildly racist veteran. Uh, The animosity between them soon gives way to respect as they investigate the newcomer underworld and especially newcomer leader, Newcomer, I keep saying newcomer. Newcomer leader <laughs> William Harcourt. And as Just call them slags. <laughs> yeah, or cucumbers, maybe. I don't know. Start a new racism against them. Um, but yeah, that's that's the uh, synopsis. And uh, I'll throw it over to you, Daniel. When's the first time you watched it? And what's your sort of general impressions of it? 
I had uh, definitely already seen uh, a bunch of the TV series before I ever saw the movie. At one point, like the, the when the Sci Fi Channel was young and it still showed like Sci Fi shit. Yeah. Uh, so this would have been in like ninety four, ninety five. They did like a, you know, this massive movie marathon. They showed like seven hundred movies in the course of you know Whoa. twenty days or something like. I don't remember exactly the details, but they had like a different theme each day. Oh yeah. And one day was big budget, you know, kind of movies, and so they did all the. So they showed like Dune, and they did you know a bunch of stuff that like where they actually had a budget behind it. But they did like creature features. They did classic, you know, they did Metropolis and all sorts of stuff. Oh yeah. And this was just what cable just used to do, <laughs> you know. We're like, oh, we've got this film library where we can air all this stuff for a month. So we're just gonna air like a shitload of movies. I saw Alien Nation as part of that because you know at that time in my life I could just sit and watch the Sci Fi Channel all day. Yeah. Uh, having seen the TV series, it was interesting. I was like, oh. Is- is that James Caan? Holy shit, you know? And uh, didn't even realize, oh, it's the guy from The Princess Bride as well, yeah. you know, as as the other guy. I mean, uh, we could talk about the makeup here in a minute. But, um, mm-hmm. yeah, saw it when I was, I mean, I don't know, 15 or so, 14, 15. Uh, saw it once. Kind of thought, oh, yeah, that was, you know, I mean, that's 80s cop movie. I mean, I've seen, I'd seen a bunch of 80s cop movies at that point. Worked pretty well. I liked some of the jokes, but uh, overall, I thought it was not nearly as interesting as the TV series, and it kind of left my mind um, until uh, we were kind of doing this series, and we've been talking about doing Bright, and all the, like, a lot of the conversation has uh, sort of revolved around uh, alienation as well. So I thought, oh, yeah, this would be a good time to, revisit it and uh, check it out and see what uh, see actually how it holds up yeah and uh, it does and it doesn't i mean it, it's kind of you know it, it it is exactly that it is this very generic 80s cop movie mm-hmm. with a you know sort of alien culture in place of the sort of generic uh kind of racial dynamic that you would kind of get from you know a lot of the other 80s cop movies which i do want to do like and i mean this is definitely solidified we should definitely do an 80s cop movie series or something i agree I yeah that's uh I think that's a really interesting kind of era for that. And uh, I think there's some interesting stuff going on. Definitely don't go for this for the plot. You know, performances, <laughs> are, performances are good. It actually probably holds up a little bit better now just because we're not quite as inundated with the uh, the sort of the, the formula as much as uh, we were at the time. Right. Um, I do think that it kind of takes, uh, you know, the the last 30 minutes are kind of on autopilot. You know, it does, mm-hmm. it does kind of do the action thing and it's sort of, you know, I mean, it's, competent but that's kind of the most you can say for it you know in the the last little bit um there is some nice adept character work in places Uh, i really like the leads i like james Conn. i like mandy patinkin a lot i like the supporting characters even though they're kind of often drawn very broadly and i like the setting i like the idea behind it i do think that it's it's doing some it's really swinging for the fences conceptually and that it really is kind of asking the audience it's asking a lot of its audience but it really is the kind of concept that uh, works a lot better. I mean, I, I haven't revisited the TV series, but I do think that this is something. I mean, today you can imagine this being a really interesting TV series. I mean, this could mm-hmm. be like a Netflix series or an HBO series. It would not be at all complicated to kind of go, oh yeah, this would be brilliant as a, you know, as, a, as kind of a modern take on this. Especially talking about you know with the way that we kind of think about the police today. I think you could do a really interesting re-envisionment, uh, re-envisioning of this. Overall, I don't know that I'm going to be revisiting the film again anytime soon, <laughs> but I think it's, you know, it's pretty good, you know? Yeah, I do like it. Uh, first time I saw it, I saw it in theaters. Uh, I was either 10 wow. or 11. Nice. Yeah. And at that time, it sort of just blew over me. Uh, it was just cop movie, action movie with aliens, you know, and, and I remember liking it, but I didn't think too much about it. So did you see it with your parents or? Yeah, I saw like, it with my parents. Yeah. Okay. But they just took you to see alienation. Was it something? Sorry, you saw it in theater, so I got to get the kind of get the like, you know. Is it, yeah, is my, it my parents like... late '80s, early '90s. There was a lot of stuff. My parents would, you know, we used to have a theater just in the next town, and they would just take me to stuff. You know, they sure, they, yeah. they they were pretty uh, permissive about what I would watch and stuff. They weren't they weren't a yeah, yeah, yeah. they weren't against the they weren't of the uh, forbidden fruit kind of idea where we got to protect our son from all these terribly horribly R-rated movies and stuff like that. They were is like, this R-rated? I think this one is. I suspect okay. it is. Yeah, it's funny how like that isn't on the Wikipedia page. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the ratings probably have changed too at this point, but um Yeah, I mean this I mean it kind of strikes me as this could probably be probably be PG-13 right. today, but you know, it might have been R then. 
Uh, it might have might might have been R rated for like the uh, boob grab that I'll uh, get oh, into. Yeah, in there's a, second. a little bit. There's a little yeah. bit of nudity, and uh, you know, some of the violence is a little bit. I mean, you know. But, yeah, but I mean, yeah, this almost passed for a TV movie today. Yes. Like, I mean, could. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, so I watched it the first time in theaters. Forgot about it. Grew up, you know, a couple years, and it started making the rounds on TV. And then this is where I realized. And thinking about it now, James Caan was a part of my sexual awakening <laughs> because I, I, I definitely uh, remember getting a little stirring in the pants the first time uh, I saw this on TV and mm-hmm. the Cassandra character came on to James Caan and basically just grabbed his arm and pulled it right up to cup her breast. And I was like, oh, that's kind of interesting. So, uh, yeah. Uh, thank you, James Conn, I guess. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you to the, uh, the actress. What's her yeah, name? Les- Leslie Beavis as well. Yeah. Beavis, yeah. I mean, I also have Leslie Beavis, uh, sexual, uh, you know, memories, but it's, it's from space balls, which mm-hmm. you now I kind of well, wish like knowing there's a shared, I kind of wish we'd done them together. I think that would be fun. <laughs> uh, <you know? laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I do like this. I think it I think it holds up fairly well as kind of, you know, uh yeah, that's what they did in the 80s and this is better than a lot of them. It's not Here here's the problem. I think this film and when I get into the trivia, I think it'll sort of pan out to this that there were cuts made. They they were making they were shooting for the fences. That there was a lot more ideas yeah. that were they're floating in the in the subtext here, but they had to make a cop movie. They had to make a hour and a half cop movie with aliens. I mean, this and... is barely ninety minutes long mm-hmm. in, in, in its final. And uh, again, the final, like I, I rewatched it this afternoon or this evening before we recorded, and basically just shut it off at the fifty, like right around the fifty-eight minute mark, just because I'm. I, I know how this movie. Ends. Like, mm-hmm. there's no, there's no reason to rewatch it from there. And it's got roughly you know kind of 15 minutes at the beginning which are really just kind of setting it up and doing a kind of a a dirty hairy knockoff almost you know where mm-hmm. the, um, you know where um james Conn says uh sykes matt sykes matt shithead we can call him <laughs> uh where his um you know his partner dies and it's very you know kind of di- like knockoff dirty hairy sequel mm-hmm. the good stuff in the film is kind of just in the relationship between um Sykes and uh, George Francisco. That's, like, that's what that's what I was gonna say. Yes, uh, Sykes is a mildly bigoted cop. You know, he's kind of an old school cop. He's, he's slightly more than mildly bigoted. I guess. Uh, yeah. Let's, but, let's just kind of go there. But uh, the the relationship's good though. Like he yeah, yeah. He, he warms up to San, uh, to George, quote unquote, mm-hmm. uh, fairly well. And and George is an interesting character because uh, I like this idea that the newcomers are they do have this kind of awe of humans and that they were willing to accept them onto their planet, like right. they're, they're, they're like he 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 makes mention of this when they're having the uh, the the sort of stereotypical the partners drink together and learn about each other moment you know um, they share they share bits of each other's culture over alcohol yeah. and spoiled milk. That's yeah, the, uh... <laughs> and I love how it sets up the spoiled milk thing too. It's just like he pulls it out of his fridge and forgets it, and then l- come back later on, the milk's spoiled, and oh, there you go, you can get right into that scene. There's there's an excuse <laughs> for spoiled milk. There, there's a line in the series which I remember like getting on thirty years later, but there's a line where the uh, in the in the TV series where uh, that version of George Francisco and they recast everybody, but he drinks, he takes a chug on a bit of milk and goes. That was a good week. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, but yeah, I, I love how he, you know, uh, George basically tells Sykes, "Man, just the fact that you people accepted us in uh, is is amazing, but it's also so disappointing how shitty you people can be as well." You know, and and you get the sense that the aliens just kind of they tolerate it because they're so lucky to. Have, found a place to like get out of mm-hmm. this slave culture that they existed in beforehand. They only sort of hint at it, you know, like they don't really go into detail in the film that basically their entire race is essentially a genetically created slave race. And you don't even know who genetically created them as far as you can tell. Um, the, well, they, don't, they don't get really get into the background at all. It really is just sort of it's presented as like, you know, the, it's just this slave race. It's just this race of beings. It's alien species as a metaphor for our own racial dynamic. You know? Yeah, yeah. And, and, and it's about the immigrant experience. So that's often a, a kind of thing that, that immigrants 
you know, I'm not an immigrant to the United States. I mean, I was born here, but it is something that you you see. It's it's a big part of the sort of that narrative is that immigrants, you know, are immigrants to the United States are often like amazed at the level of you know the the soaring ideals that are yeah. you know there in this sort of like American founding documents and in the sort of the idea behind like what it's supposed to mean to be an American and then are like thoroughly disgusted by the realities of, you know, yeah, how what many are confronted with. Yeah. Um, but also, you know, how uh, rarely the U S actually sort of lives up to that ideal. Right. Um, and these, these and are played paradox of America. I, I mean, you know, you're a Canadian, so you don't have to, you know, deal oh, no, with that we, quite, we, quite as strong a level, but you know, we, we still do have the same problems. And I mean, actually, in a way, we have this problem probably a bit more than you guys do in this situation where these aren't necessarily immigrants. Uh, th- these are more stand-ins for refugees who wash up on shore kind of right. idea, right? Well, it's I mean, like- and, and today, I mean, um, yeah, no, I mean, it's, it's very much that. I mean, it's interesting how, like, today this is, I mean, these ideas are much more um, potent mm-hmm. in terms of, you know, exactly, you know, kind of who these people are supposed to be in there current sort of issues around immigration and refugee crisis and all that sort of thing. I mean, I could definitely see a remake of this being uh, really, really controversial. If you yeah. Know. Yeah. I, I, yeah, that would be one of those movies where a bunch of fucking dude bros would start a Twitter campaign against it. You know, you know, this... oh, <laughs> there would be a Twitter campaign to get this shut down if they decided mm-hmm. to remake this, you know, I would, I, w- I would say that there is this sort of a um, kind of basic, I mean, Whenever you kind of use aliens to stand in for sort of, you know, racial dynamics or, or some sort of the generic other, there is always this um, question. And this is something that just sort of goes all throughout. I mean, this isn't unique to this film. I mean, you know, like Star Trek and even like old kind of golden age mm-hmm. science fiction kind of did the same thing. Well, you know, George Francisco actually is alien. Like he actually he actually is really different biologically. Yeah. In a way that black people are not different from, you know, yeah. white people in the United States or, you know, sort of sort of Hispanic immigrant, you know, Mexican immigrants, Mexican day laborers or whatever. Using that as a, the, the metaphor breaks down on that level, you know, and that mm-hmm. is sort of like cultural differences versus, you know, actual physical, biological differences. Also, you know, the uh, there there is a sort of a justifiable fear if you've got this sort of army of a quarter of a million you know, people who are, you know, super adaptable, can learn languages really well, can breathe things that you can't and are, you know, three times as strong as you are, <laughs> you know, there, there, there is a little bit, it's, it's kind of just fun to go like, well, what's going to happen here in 10 years, all of the jobs are going to be taken by, you know, these people you know, who they actually are, you know, much more valuable to capitalism than I am. You know? they're, they're, uh, the alien's design is very kind of subtly brilliant, I think, because mm-hmm. they're kind of blank slates. They yeah. all base, uh, so there, there, of course, there's that uh, Asiatic, they all look the same kind of idea. And then there's also, they're good at math. So there's the Asian kind of coding there. Then there's the, they're physically stronger and more athletic than us. So there's the uh, black coding there you know um i would like to note he is using that in quotes that was yeah. not you know he's, he, uh, air we're, quotes we're, we we are two white guys aware of uh just how <laughs> terrible this could sound if we're if, if you're if you're uh wanting to make it sound bad okay let's and, just, and yeah. yeah and and the take our jobs bullshit that's right. that's the latino thing you know because well, it's 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 all i mean it, it is i mean it, it's sort of all the all the stereotypes about uh, the other wrapped into kind of one circumstance. Mm-hmm. Um, and again, in the series, they, they even like kind of demonstrate that the um, child is gestated in the female body, but then it's transferred into yeah. the male. And then like, I think that one of the episodes of the series has San Francisco actually like give birth to the baby. Oh, really? Like, yeah. He actually is pregnant for an episode or two. Yeah. Basically like it goes into a pouch on him or something. I forget the details, but I know they, in the they, series they use, it, they use it as a metaphor for like gay and lesbian rights and that sort of thing. Right. I mean, they, and also they actually do some really interesting stuff with that. Also, I do remember like I did see a few episodes of the series and I did a little reading on it too, and it sparked my memories. There's like a third sex in the in the newcomers race as well. Like they're they're kind of a uh asexual or something like that kind of like they're, they're i don't not, i don't remember the details i mean yeah. I, I would believe you i mean they're, they're trying to do a lot of stuff and, and this is this is and i think that this is kind of where 
I mean, we're very clearly kind of putting our finger on the the real issue here is that it's wedded to this cop movie concept. Mm-hmm. And even if they had decided, even if they didn't have to do that, it could just kind of explore this idea. There's way too much here for a 90 minute That's film. That's right. Yeah. You know, they've got this really big, glorious idea. And they, they really, I mean, they, they really give it a good effort. I, I mean, I think this... I mean, I, I, we had thought about uh, maybe doing this alongside District 9, but we just kind of didn't get around to kind of doing mm-hmm. District 9. This. District 9, I think, in a lot of ways, is a better film than this. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think, and I, and I think that the high points of District 9 are better than so the high points of this. I think this is kind of a little bit more generic. But at the same time, I think this really uh, justifies its premise a little bit better. Whereas I think District 9 kind of drops the ball a little bit earlier and kind of becomes something that isn't really quite as interesting a little yeah. bit earlier on and, and kind of doesn't kind of justify its world. It kind of it kind of gets into the 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 magic, <laughs> you know, um, the magic plot a little bit earlier on um, than, yeah. uh, than Alien Nation does. Whereas I think Alien Nation basically plays fair with this audience all the way up until the last like uh, 20 minutes or so where you get, you know, magic drug that also turns uh, people into our newcomers into uh, dangerous mutant monster right. things, um, which is completely unnecessary as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. It's and like- just there to, to create this sort of, you know, tension and even, and even it's not used for anything, you know, because basically our, our lead bad guy, who's Terrence Stamp, who's mm-hmm. really good here. I mean, mm-hmm. you forget, how, I mean, you don't forget how good Terrence Stamp is, but yeah, I didn't. I forgot it was Terrence Stamp. In Me this, too. And he's amazing in this. Um, and he t- the, the whole plot of the film is around this drug that the newcomers got a, as uh, you know slaves on the ship, and then it turns out that if you consume enough of it, then you kind of go into this hibernation state, and then you like wake yeah. up as super newcomer with like yeah superpowers and yeah, yeah and none of that none of that works at it, all. they they didn't need it it it, uh, it all should have been just about the actual drug abuse problem in their race that that's yeah. what it should have been about because i mean george makes it fucking like that's a good sort of turning point for george where he just finally gets fed up and he's listen we're gonna fucking stamp out this drug and the reason I kept it secret from you, Sykes, is because if humans found out that th- this this was a problem for our race, it would just cause more and more problems for us being yeah. accepted into the culture, right? And well, so that, the line that Manny Patinkin has, where he says, "You know, it was our only source of pleasure. Mm-hmm. The more you, the more you worked, the more you got." That's a line that I remember from seeing this 20 years ago. Yeah. Like I, I, that line reading has stuck with me literally for decades. You know, that scene in particular. I mean, there, there's some really powerful stuff in this. And it's, I love the character yeah, work in this. I do think all, it's really great. It's all character based, it's all performance based. Yeah. Again, there's a lot in this that works really, really well. Um, and, yeah. it's, and it's kind of understated as well. It's not, you know, it's not like, oh, he starts like breaking things or whatever. It's no. just a line reading, you know? Yeah, and I think I think one of the biggest strengths of this that sort of sets it apart from a lot of this sort of the buddy cop movies in this era is actually the character work is a lot of lot better than a lot of them. Yeah. Where it's it's not just a gimmick, it's not just comedy and oh look how different they are. It's like look how different they are and we're actually gonna explore it a little bit. And the actors are actually really good and they got lines and they got something to work with, you know. You, you, you honestly you don't really see a lot of that in a lot of the sort of buddy cop movies it's just they're two buddies and they're kicking ass and maybe they (laughs) maybe they get in a fight over a woman or something you know it's it's generic bullshit this movie actually is shooting for something bigger and unfortunately the last third of it kind of just falls apart and i mean the car chase is terrible definitely i mean you kind of the director on this went on to kind of do a bunch of tv and it definitely feels like this is a tv director you know um it's not it's not that it's bad it's just that it feels like an episode of tj hooker oh no i i I would i would say it's bad uh i mean the the car the car the car chase chase is terrible Uh uh-huh james Kahn cannot run (laughs) <laughs> did you see that fucking pathetic run he that little light jog he does on the bridge or whatever it's like dude um, he he looks a little bit like he's trying to uh he he just hit a chili dog 
and he's uh, trying to <laughs> not trying shit. to not shit shit all over the place. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> and also this this movie, you, you can tell the ending is tacked on because there's like bad ADR at the end of it too. Where, oh yeah, yeah. yeah. It's like oh, come and even on. even like a voiceover that just sort of appears out of nowhere, and mm-hmm. it's just like yeah. So, um, so tell me what did uh, I mean? Not to not to jump ahead or to kind of force you not to, but I feel like you know we've kind of we're both kind of middling on the film, kind of missed potential, but but not. I mean, look, this film, you know, it became a TV series that lasted a season, and then there mm-hmm. are no, there are five made for TV movies, yeah, and like a book series. I mean this. This stuff I haven't like explored all that. I think I've seen like one or two of the made for TV movies. This idea did get explored in other media, you know, and and I think it's worth noting that kind of talking about this was a moderate success enough that, you know, sort of the people kind of gave this chance to breathe. And, it became a sci-fi franchise that at the very least was bigger than Tech War. <laughs> yeah. Also, we totally need to do some of the Tech War movies at some point. Oh my point. god. Okay, I'm on, I'm on board. I, I actually watched that series and liked that series when it was not in the mid nineties. And I would have seen it around the same time that I saw this. So, uh, yeah, I, <laughs> some of those are on YouTube. I've got one in my, like, you know, watch later queue and it's been there for like three years. So wow. uh, one day, w- one day we are going to have to to go and, and revisit the tech war. Um, that was a TV series as well. I think that lasted like two or three seasons, you know? Yeah, so, it did. Yeah. Um, with Greg Evigan, who you might also know as being the guy who wasn't Paul Reiser on My Two Dads. <laughs> you know what I like about the fucking Alien Nation TV series is that the uh, the guy who's uh, standing in for Sykes actually kind of looks like Mick Jagger. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, he's got the he's got the kind of the, the not quite yeah. the mullet because he's got a little bit too long on the front, but yeah. Um, yeah. And the uh, the guy, I don't know, I I don't think you ever watched Parks and Recreation, but the guy who played San Francisco in the TV series, mm-hmm. not Manny Patinkin in the movie, but the guy who played it, he had a bit part in Parks and Recreation where he played a police chief. <laughs> and he's in like a handful of episodes. Is it's like kind of the the tough guy, no nonsense, gruff police chief that they are that they're always going to for favors. Nice. And uh, yeah, it's it's one of those things. I looked it up and like, oh, who is that character? And I like, like, holy shit, it's that guy. And then once you see it, you can't unsee it. Awesome. <laughs> so, I like to think it's the spiritual successor to his role in Alien Nation. <laughs> yeah, you know, the tough guy, police chief in Pawnee, Indiana. Anyway, yeah. so tell me about the tell me about the backstory. What what are we missing? What do we not see in this film? Enough um, that I'm trying to rush you into uh, the. Uh, uh, the trivia. I'm just kind of like, you know, it feels yeah. like there might be a story that's worth discussing in the. Uh... So, like we said, we, we we talked about how it had a TV series that lasted one season, five TV movies. Before we get to the uh, dickering with this movie, Kurt Sobel, who does the soundtrack here, actually replaced Jerry Goldsmith of all people. Wow. wow. Yeah. Apparently, Goldsmith score is rejected because it was too weird and too, honestly, too weird for the aliens in L.A. movie. You know. And I mean, honestly, I, I've listened to both soundtracks. They're not that far apart. They're kind of similar in what they're going so, for. So so the studio was fucking around with the movie for no reason? That clearly was never something. Was <laughs> um, but you can get you can get Goldsmith's rejected uh, score now. Um, it awesome. was Yeah, so you, you can find it out there. Prior to the theatrical release, this movie was heavily re-edited in post-production in order for the film to be shorter. Uh, originally, the movie was supposed to be released in the summer, but due to this drastic and severe re-editing, the picture was instead released in October 1988. Post-production re-editing is also one of the reasons why Jerry Goldsmith's original music score had to be removed and replaced. Hmm. Uh, apparently, they thought there was some sort of tonal thing, and I, I couldn't find how long the original cut of this was supposed to be, but I'm assuming maybe two hours. I mean, if they're, if they're doing a significant recut, it sounds like they've... Yeah, that's interesting. Does it say anything? I mean, do we know anything else about like what was? No, I, I, mean, I mean, I I dug around a little bit, but from all I could sort of gather, I mean, there, there might be more to this that someone else might know. And if they do, please let us know. It just seems like the typical. Come on, kid. We we need a we need to spice this up with a little bit of action. There's too much of this goddamn talking with these aliens. And uh, I mean, can we have like an alien broad with some tits maybe and stick them in the movie? And you know, it, it just seems like it was just. This movie isn't going to sell to anybody in 1988 unless we, you know, put some car chases and some shooting in it, you know? Well, I, I feel like I feel like maybe 
given what we know about the way that this thing, these things happen in 88 and, and, you know, today they would totally just kind of go and reshoot stuff because they just throw a little bit more money at it and kind of mm-hmm. do it. But I think in 88, there were much more, there was a much more of a sense of like, we'll just cut it down and make it like vaguely palatable. Right. Yeah. So it sounds like, especially since we know that this went on to be kind of a bigger franchise with some more interesting stuff in it, it sounds like maybe, what was cut out of it was was a lot of the nuance and a lot of the kind of character work. I mean, yeah. a lot of the stuff that we like about it. I mean, like, look, I don't, I don't blame. You know, I mean, if this movie was two hours and it's got kind of forty minutes of you know car chases, even if they're kind of in chart car chases and and uh, you know, sort of the the monster movie plot. Like, okay, well, fine. If you kind of give me, I mean, my, the real criticism is like, okay, it takes twenty minutes for the movie to really get started, and then the last forty is kind of you know generic action mm-hmm. movie nonsense and so you really only got like 30 minutes of like real movie here but if we had like an hour real movie you know of, of something that was kind of going at something with a, with a little bit more um interest and nuance and you got some more terrence stamp and you got some yeah. more of the the dynamic between um george and sykes i mean i could definitely kind of get on board with this being yeah this is actually a much more kind of worthy visit you know even if yeah even if you still want to turn it off it you know 20 minutes for the edit because yeah the i mean in, in in this movie i could have used like 20 more minutes of insight into how they're the aliens have integrated because you get hints mm-hmm. because you well, you can I see mean, that's, like all all levels of society they, they've integrated into that's the that's the the sort of the bit of world building that just kind of doesn't work and i mean world building so spoiler alert although we have not hidden this at all we're going to do bright next week and mm-hmm. bright is the absolute failure of world building um <laughs> I mean, it's just the fundamental, like, it's just the most awful world building I've seen in a film in a long time. Mm-hmm. And Alien Nation is, Alien Nation is better because it's just, it's, it can't not be worse than that. <laughs> I mean, it just can't, like, it's hard to, it's hard to imagine a more stupid bit of world building than Bright. It's, um, it's the uh, best, it, best two words in the English language, default. <laughs> but it is asking us to accept this like oh the aliens arrived three years ago like so so recently that uh you know they all just sort of remember all being in the same thing together and yet they've integrated you've got newcomers is not only do they have their own little communities but i mean they, they it's just all of a society they own little like shops they, they they're you know and, and yet they, they seem like settled into the society in a way and, and i feel like that's sort of one of those um it is one of the failures of the film in terms of, in terms of a, i mean even if it was like even if it was like 15 years yeah if you kind of okay well you, they've had enough time to get the kind of make their way or whatever and they try to hand wave it by going like oh we're just like super adaptable that's just who we are we just adapt to whatever and that's the and you just kind of you just kind of smile and nod but like three years i mean it's certainly i mean the film was released in 88 and it's set in 91 and i mean i think uh reagan appears at the beginning on the on the tv screen is uh, so, so it is definitely supposed to, you know, basically the idea is 30 seconds after you leave the theater seeing this in 1988, you know, aliens landed and yeah. that, that's when this all started. I get the sort of idea of like, they didn't want to uh, kind of do the, the near future kind of thing that they, they didn't want to set it in, you know, 2004 or whatever, yeah. you know, and, and kind of like have to worry with, oh, and now we need like futuristic cars and stuff, but they also didn't want to do kind of a straight up alternate history. I mean, it's always kind of the challenge of, well, how do you kind of approach this? Um, District 9, you know, that's one of the things they do well because it's kind of like, oh, it's been 30 years, but then, you know, we kind of have this history where the aliens landed at this time, but they've been in this shanty town the whole time. And yeah, so, you know, it's a reservation have to, deal. White have to deal with it in the same way. I feel like this film could have done something similar. But then again, I mean, if you're in 1988 and you say, oh, well, they landed it, you know, 20 years earlier, then suddenly you've got this whole other, you know, they landed in the middle of, you know, the, the most politically contentious era in, you know, the 20th century American yeah. history. So, and you, know, so. you, you also got to grant that they were all let out of quarantine within like a year or whatever, too. It's right, like, right. I mean, whoa. you know, there's... I mean, you know, for for me, it's like, you know, if this happened in real life, I mean, even, I mean, in the Reagan 80s, I mean, look, they would have been nuked. There's no, the, you yeah. Know, but there, the, you know, let's let's not pretend this was, uh, you know, it, it's very very kind to the actual political ruling class that was in existence in 1988. But uh, you know, let's also let's also not even think about how 
actual aliens arriving on Earth would disrupt every social and political structure we know to exist right now I mean, and probably the, profoundly the, change them as well. The, the level of like bigotry that they get, I mean, you mm-hmm. know, which is obviously atrocious and all that sort of thing, but it's also not a scratch on what, you know, like a quarter of a million actual aliens showing right. up in los angeles in 1988 would you know the idea that they just kind of show up and suddenly like whole neighborhoods are theirs and stuff i mean it's it's um... uh, I, I do find it funny though like the way some of the human employers and stuff treat these aliens is like yeah, yeah. Uh, it's like how uh today's sort of american employers treat undocumented workers and stuff well they're really good fucking workers <laughs> so let's bring them on i mean not to get to find a point on it, but if you eat meat in the United States, if you eat meat in North America and in, in the United States and Canada, mm-hmm. you, know, you know, I had chicken for dinner and that chicken was killed by a Mexican laborer, by an immigrant or someone like they're even hiring. I mean, basically they're importing people from like Somalia and stuff, you know, right. Uh, Somalian refugees to go work in like Tyson chicken factories oh, yeah. and basically, and basically do like 12 hour days working on a killing floor, killing, uh, killing my food for me mm-hmm. that's not quite the level of oh they they all go like hang out in an area where what is it what's the oh. gas that's in the is it is it is it natural gas it's the, oh, me- some, methane they, they can't yeah, they can't like high uh, levels of methane there yeah. they're you know it's not quite to the level of like oh the newcomers you know methane is not poisonous to them you know sort of thing but it's not far from that you know yeah here in Nova Scotia, we get uh, migrant workers all the time. We get Mexican migrant workers. We get Haitian and Jamaican migrant workers. They come on to the farms because there's just plenty of work on the farms that no one here locally wants to do. They come in, they do it. Uh, I, I still get a fucking kick, man. Um, the Jamaicans were up one season, and it was 35 between 35 and 39 degrees Celsius with the humidex. So God. that's that's like hundreds or whatever. For a fair that's over 100. That's over yeah. 100. Yeah. Uh, man, this, this Jamaican guy, <laughs> he was driving down the street on a bicycle. He had a winter jacket on. <laughs> <laughs> I still got a fucking kick out of that, man. <laughs> Holy shit. But uh, yeah, they, they, they bring him in. They do the fucking work and they do a better job. So what the fuck? Well, and, and I mean, you know, it's just, it's just a sort of like, well, they keep prices low and they keep, you know, mm-hmm. like, and I mean, this thing, which is like fundamentally exploitative, which is, you know, our, I mean, look, I eat meat. I don't, I'm not like blaming a, I'm not, I'm not saying there's a, there's a moral issue here. I have many uh, vegetarian friends who, you know, but factory farming is an atrocity. I mean, mm-hmm. it just, it just is these are literal butchers and uh, I, I don't blame the, the poor uh, immigrants and the, and the poor people, even, even the, you know, um, <laughs> even white people who decide to work in these factories, yeah. you know, who I don't blame anybody for, for doing that work and, and, and making a living that way. But the idea that like we've built a system that, that makes this happen. I mean, it's just, mm-hmm. it's, it's fundamentally disgusting yeah. um, because it doesn't have to be this way. But it is because, like, that's just how the system works. It would be nice if this film kind of it, it has that stuff in the corners, and it yeah. has it has a lot of that stuff kind of kind of buried in it. And uh, it would be nice if the film explored that to a more significant degree. Yeah, but um, it can't it do it because it's the buddy cop movie it becomes a buddy cop movie, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, and I wish it had used the buddy cop movie as more of a uh, just sort of a framing device to kind of right. like watch these two guys i mean you don't even need the like the racism between the two characters i mean you could literally just do a these two guys are partners and they wander around los angeles just questioning people and like get into like yeah, you know you, see, you in, could it, do a minimalist version of this and it would be fascinating you know see i like i like your scenario better of the uh it, it, they've been here for 15 years so they've integrated so say they say they arrived in 1975 or something instead mm-hmm. and and i mean you know have the wherewithal to do some societal changes and stuff like that so make the world feel a bit more legit and just these two are partners they've been partners for years And, you know, maybe the human partner isn't quite as aware of some of the stuff with uh, the newcomers uh, society. And they they're just a day in their life or a week in their life or whatever. And they just 
tour around newcomer society and run into things. And it's kind of the reaction of the human partner and the explanations from the newcomer. And maybe the newcomer's hiding some things from him. And that leads into some sort of conflict. But other than that, you don't need this overarching the drug's going to turn them into super monsters, and that's the big mm-hmm. bad guy well, you have to fight. The, the actual, the actual drug plot, I actually kind of like. I do um, in the film. I mean, until it becomes the super monster. The super, thing, yeah, you know? that's the crap part. When it when it becomes like, oh, this is you know the idea that like, oh, there are drugs and drugs coming from the community, and this is an immigrant community and that sort of thing, and and just mm-hmm. sort of the the way that San Francisco responds to it, like he just wants to break everything. Is I mean that that feels really authentic to me. Yeah. And that said, my I always had this like fantasy if I was going to write like a buddy cop movie or, or sort of a sort of a police procedural, like I would write. I always think there's this scene in an episode of Law and Order where um, Benjamin Bratt and uh, Jerry Orbach have to uh, go like they they find a cigar box or something, and they have to find. They're using it as a clue to kind of go and like figure out something about so they're basically looking for the guy who bought these cigars and they're like mm-hmm. fancy cigars and uh they say it's like a throwaway line oh yeah we had to go to like 12 cigar shops in order to like find the guy and i always wanted to just write the movie where like we're just gonna walk around in this neighborhood where there are a bunch of cigar shops or so we're gonna just go around new york city and drive to 12 cigar shops and like question the people until we find like and the whole point is just let's just follow these guys around in their day yeah question, you know because you could do anything with that, right? I mean, the whole thing is, like, we're just kind of walking into situations. And uh, I would love to see that version of this movie, right? I would love yeah. to see newcomer society through the lens of we're looking for this one piece of information. At the end, we find, like, the one person at you or whatever. And that's that's the movie, you know? Yeah, yeah. I think uh, we'll touch on uh, Court Psyops and Darren Wilson's uh, comments here now since we've sort of okay. gotten kind of deep into this. Uh, so I think we've answered a lot of uh, Court Psyops uh, sort of uh, question here. Uh, well, you he don't says, have to read it then. It's fine. Uh, yeah, well, yeah, 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 yeah. Fuck Court. Fuck you, Court. Yeah, yeah. Fuck uh, you. By the okay. way, I'm going to be on his podcast next month. Um, oh, okay. So I should probably not say fuck you. Uh, <laughs> so it says. I it think says, he would fuck you. I think he would invite you on if you said fuck you. Yeah, he, he really, really, it. really, really. The thing is, I, I've, I, I've heard so many nice things about the podcast, and I really need to start listening to it. It's kind of the, the. Yeah, you really should because you're kind yeah. of a prick not doing it. I, um, I'm an ass. I did. I just show up. I just show up and talk. That's all I do. <laughs> God, I don't uh, listen to podcasts. No, fuck that. Well, shit. I do. I do, but they're all neo Nazi podcasts. That's yeah, all. Yeah, unfortunately, <laughs> yeah. You, you should maybe get a palate cleanser and do some cinema yeah. psyops. Yeah, definitely. Uh, but Court says, uh, do the social commentary elements of this story resonate better in today's political climate in the States than at the time of the film's release? And he says, uh, if you watch the resulting TV series and TV movies, did you like the expanded worlds of the aliens as well as the developing dynamics of the aliens and humans learning to live together and respect each other's cultural differences? I think we've kind of answered that. I mean, yeah. yeah, I mean, from what I remember, the TV series definitely does it better. And um, it just has a lot more room to breathe. Mm-hmm. Um, any immigrant experience is even more relevant today than it was in 88. And it's interesting. Right. 88 a really interesting kind of moment in history for the immigrant experience and, and sort of the underclass and, and sort of like, because we're, this is post sort of Reagan actually did a little bit of a, did a little bit of an amnesty. And I think 86 um, in terms of uh, immigration um, and the idea being like, Oh, no, we're not going to let any more of them in. And of course, you know, capitalism does this thing and and i think there's a like sort of i mean there's this tension in terms of immigration and sort of job access and so yeah saying, like you know you want to be completely uh 100 on board with marginalized people in society but at the same time you know <laughs> capitalist oppressors are bringing you know people into the country specifically to drive wages down you know and so yeah um that kind of sense of being happy with the individuals who are coming in and, and kind of giving people the, the chance to sort of have full human rights in our society has to also come along with a sense with a, a sort of respect for wages and, and how do you balance those? I and mean, I think that is a complicated question. And I think that that is something that, you know, 
really it's like in capitalism and we're all going to be happy together. That's kind of the answer. Yeah. That, you know? <laughs> uh, yeah. And I, I pretty much agree there. I, I mean, unfortunately both of us just sort of have vague memories of the TV series more than anything else in the, in the TV movie. I didn't see any of the TV movies, so I, I can't even speak. I think I saw the first one, but I don't, I mean, they get into because there's another like there's another ship that shows up or like there's some oh, yeah. kind of plot involving like there's there are more newcomers that come from somewhere else and uh there was the the only thing i remember about it is there's a detail whereby because in the film um salt water is like uh sulfuric acid yeah to, to, the, to the to the newcomers and then you find out that uh you know the way you can tell a new newcomer like is because they get like little sores on their face and around their neck because the, uh, the salt water just in the air, like, the, I mean, they oh, just yeah. get like little sores. And then that goes away after a while where they just kind of get used to it. And so I remember that being like a plot point and that's all I remember. Oh, yeah. And yeah, they make a point that the uh, newcomers, um, because of their physio- uh, physio- physiology, physiology, physiology thank you they kind of adapt really quickly like very yeah, very yeah. short time like also because they're a genetically created race like they've just been genetically created to do that sort of thing you know to be like the perfect labor force it's, it's interesting that we don't get any kind of context on like what were they doing before yeah you know, because they've become doctors and lawyers and you know shopkeepers and detectives and all kinds of stuff and it's like well what you know, were you literally just a labor force? It's, you know, were you, yeah. were you literally just like moving stuff? Or I mean, you know, were you picking cotton on you know Jesus. some Jesus. space Jesus. Mississippi, you know, or something? You know, or, you know, like, you know yeah, there's, they, they you know, never, we don't, we don't, we don't get that sense. And I don't even think the series ever really. No, I mean, they, know, never, uh, like they never, they uh, never showed the. They were very ambiguous about it. They never showed the slave masters, and yeah. they and they made they made sort of hints that maybe the one the the uh newcomers that were the overseers of the rest of the the lower class slaves were maybe they just genetically were the ones that genetically created the slave race within their own race or whatever but yeah um yeah they never really got to that i guess but uh eh. I kind of like that. I kind of like that. I kind of like that, I, you know. I kind of I kind of like that we don't get I mean because there's always the thing of, you know, we want answers. We want like definitive like let's tell the backstory and Ultimately, the point is the backstory, but it's also like understanding. I mean, you could get into some real things about the, the sort of the African Americans, for instance, mm-hmm. and kind of understanding what the slavery experience has kind of done culturally over time, and right. sort of you know um, the idea of well, there were slaves who were like trained artisans who were you know who mm-hmm. worked in factories who did you know who who were not just used for the the strength of their backs, and I think that that's something that gets missed in sort of popular conceptions of um, American slavery. And um, certainly the difference between sort of American slavery, I mean, American slavery lasted for like 250 years and talking about like a tobacco farm in 1690 versus, uh, you know, a plantation, a cotton plantation in 1840, you're talking about very, very different, you know, kind of circumstances. Um, Not to talk, not even to mention like the fact that, you know, slavery in Brazil or Haiti and the Haitian revolution and all that sort of thing. I mean, the thing is, whenever you start talking about this and whenever you start kind of bringing up these topics, there's this huge complicated can of worms that you're just opening that you can then like draw stories from and draw parallels from. And I don't even think the the series or any of the films ever really gets into it to any level of depth. And I think that that's the idea of kind of saying, what did you do? Like, what did, why did you want to become, even just the question, why did you want to become a detective? Oh, Mm -hmm. well, you know, before when I was a hatchling or whatever, you know, I was um, always the, the, the kid who was trying to protect the, uh, the other kids or whatever. You get a, you do get a sort of a sense that uh, George cares deeply about like his community, like the, um, the murder they investigate. Mm-hmm. And where he he's he's talking to the uh, the wife, and that that little scene where he hugs her, you know, after he's talking to her, mm-hmm. you, you get the sense that this is like a really decent guy who deeply oh, yeah. cares about his community. Oh, right? He, Mandy Patinkin, I mean, San Francisco is uh, George Francisco, whatever. It's such a square, 
And I and I kind of love those characters mm-hmm. in movies. He's so, like even the way he waves to his wife, he has that like kind of limp wristed little wave that he does. <laughs> you know, hey, yeah, I love you. And it's like, oh, I do that to my wife. Like it's fine. You know, like, yeah, yeah. there's no there's no uh, no judgment there. But I, I love I love how much of a square he is and how like much of a tough guy James Con wants to be. You know, it's it's. Uh, I think this uh, is gonna come back in our bright conversation for sure. Yeah, I think I think George would get along with Frank Drebin pretty well. I think. They'd oh, be yeah. oh yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> or no, uh, I'm thinking of uh, Frank Drebin. That's Leslie Nielsen's that, that's, character. That's Leslie Nielsen and Naked Gun, which yeah, I'm, probably I'm thinking, also true. But probably, uh, but I'm, I'm thinking of Dragnet. Um, oh, oh, oh uh, Joe Friday. Joe Friday. Yes. That's, that's, I, are you talking about the original? Or are you talking about like the Tom Hanks, uh, Dan Aykroyd uh, kind of? Uh, he, he, he he'd get along with Aykroyd too. I think they'd do okay. pretty well. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I kind of I kind of want to see. Um, <laughs> I kind of want to see um, San Francisco with what's his name, uh, Guy Pierce's character from LA Confidential. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I can't think of the name, but yeah, they would. I think they do good too. I think of Bud White, but it's not. But Bud White is uh, 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 Russell Crowe. Russell Crowe, yeah, no, yeah. Uh, we'll get to, to the other question here. Uh, Darren Wilson, what buddy cop movie would you double feature this with, and why? And I'll throw it to you first. Um, in the heat of the night. Is mm-hmm. that a buddy cop movie? I mean, I don't know. Um, kind of, kind of a projector. I mean, it's the '60s. It's not. It's not really a buddy cop movie, but. Yeah, I mean, it, it's obviously trying to kind of do some of the same things that explore some of the same territory. Um, yeah. And it was also uh, a TV series later on. Right. So so there is that connection. Uh, if you, I feel, oh, <laughs> I mean, there's so many great, like, uh, you know, I kind of want to go like Tango and Cash for the, uh, you know, just the, <laughs> um, no, I mean, uh, God, I feel, I feel like I, I've got the, you know, Lethal Weapon, maybe. That's Maybe, got that's yeah. got some sort of an interesting. What's your answer? While I while I think about it a little bit more, uh, the two I thought of, and I'm man, actually, in the heat of the night, I think actually is a probably the, the stone cold awesome answer to this. But um, I would I would say uh, Red Heat, uh, uh, just because of is like that the this, James Belushi Arnold Schwarzenegger one. Yeah, just okay. because of the the. Su- the supreme cultural difference between the two characters, I think yeah. uh, because it's, it's kind of Arnold Schwarzenegger taking Belushi into his world, you know, like, so there's, there's kind of a correlation between the two films in that respect. And also uh, I think colors works as well for this. I've never seen colors. So, Oh shit. Uh, yeah. Okay. Well, uh, yeah, you should watch that before we do bright. I, well, I will. Oh. Maybe. <laughs> if I have time, yeah, in my copious free time, I'll, I'll sit down and watch colors. Uh, yeah, no, it's such like the generic version of it, you know, that it's kind of mm-hmm. hard to. You know, again, in the heat of the night, could have been kind of a model for this, right? Yeah, you know? it's not hard to imagine. You know, newcomer shows up in a small town in you know Southern California. Oh, I'm from L.A. I'm the genius you know yeah. alien who can solve every equation or whatever who who knows everything and i show up in this small town in california and suddenly we're after a serial killer with the racist cop who's like you know all oh, these slag motherfuckers uh, yeah you know. oh mr genius slag right out of right out of cop school gonna tell me what to do they call me mr francisco yeah <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't quite have the impact of Mr. Tibbs, but no, still. It, it doesn't. It doesn't. They call me Sam Francisco. <laughs> <laughs> I kind of wish they'd done that in this movie, just as a yeah. little tribute. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, it's it's uh that's I think that's where we'd land with uh, Alien Nation is it's largely missed opportunity, but they they had a lot of chances to kind of pick that up and and explore a lot of it and I uh you you have to kind of give them credit for that it's it's uh one of those things that uh I do want to revisit that series at some point but yeah uh, unless you have anything else to say about it Daniel I think we're both kind of uh, mildly thumbs up on this one I'd say well, mildly thumbs up I mean, if you're interested in the genre and I mean you know. D- Worth a look. And I mean, James Caan gets to feel up Le- Leslie Beavis and her alien boob. So that's a, that's actually a really nice performance that she gives. And, it and is. I mean, yeah, there, there are, there are some, I mean, for all the things that we'd say about the sort of the, the plotting and the direction and, and et cetera, 
there's some really nice performances in this, and we we haven't really delved into those. But I think I think there's really not a weak performance in the film. No, just, and you know. and I and I will say this: there's really no other than Leslie Beavis, and you see friend San Francisco's wife. There's really no female characters in this at all. Kind of, yeah. it's good. I mean, um, in the in the truck drink, uh, uh, Cassandra, she's a, a little bit of a femme fatale. Yeah, I like to think maybe she's in the extended cut a little bit more. Um, I would hope so, but yeah, no, it's it, she. She's the girl, you know. She's, yeah, she she's. Does. I mean, not even that. She's the stripper. Yeah, and, you know. Although it's a very, um, it, it really is a a, a case of a, an actress bringing more to a role than uh, <laughs> was really there on the page, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, kind of justifying her her salary a little bit more than than a male character uh, actor would have had to, but. Um, and uh, I, I kind of wonder if like uh, Star Trek DS Nine sort of copied from this because you you got so like the spots on the aliens, you got the uh, Jim Adar later on in the series with where they're a slave race that's got drugs given to them. I I wouldn't be. I mean, I don't think that that idea is is original to this. Pro, yeah, um, no, but I mean, still. it kind of does that thing which a lot of kind of sci fi, especially around this era kind of did a, of taking, you know, kind of socially relevant science fiction where it would take some mm-hmm. social issue like racism and it would turn it into this thing about, it, you know, aliens and kind of kind of distance itself that way, which Star Trek, Star Trek was kind of famous for that even, even back in the 60s. <laughs> the thing is, this was doing like the gritty on the streets version of it. It's just that mm-hmm. it's doing that in the sort of genre of like the, the 80s action movie, buddy cop movie, kind of comedy. That's not necessarily the correct vehicle to really uh sell this yeah yeah but anyway it's it, it it is what it is it could be better it could be worse i'd love to see a remake and a reboot of this i'd love I, to see I, a tv series i agree and i think it it would probably be worth revisiting the old tv series and the five tv movies mm. which is kind of amazing that they did five of them that's 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 kind of astonishing over the course yeah. of like two years too i mean it was boom, yeah boom, boom 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 you know they were they were kind of making them all the time um yeah, uh, budget for this was sixteen million, and it came back with thirty two point one million. So, I mean, which was a moderate hit at the time. I mean, yeah. you know, in eighty eight, thirty two million. I mean, at the time, there were only you know, like I think twenty or thirty films that had ever made more than hundred million dollars. So you, you know, can uh, you can see why it went to TV instead of like a sequel. Because I yeah. I kind of figured like they figured a sequel. And theaters would be diminishing returns at that point. Of course, uh, at that time they didn't have marketing budgets that were, you know, the entire budget of the film. Yeah, you know. <laughs> so yeah. um, I kind of wonder if maybe the reason it went to TV was more the creators sort of understood that's where this would live better. I, I do, I do, kind of. I would yeah. love to see kind of a kind of an interview or, or kind of. I would love to to chat with the guy and go. So tell me how this happened exactly. You know. I kind of get the feeling that it's almost like the movie exists as a justification for the expanded universe. That's what yeah. I was about to say. It's like I was, I'm thinking O'Bannon here. Basically, this is his get inside kind of pass kind of thing. Like right, this right. is his credibility, and then that with this, it's like it gives him the clout to, hey man, I made a successful movie. Uh, so probably a movie that was more successful than they expected. And I'm I'm going to throw my big TV dick around now and maybe make some TV series. Yeah, well, he goes on to, to make. I mean, Farscape is a mm. classic. Uh, DSV, Sequest DSV, really underrated TV show with first, a lot uh, of really interesting ideas in it. You know, first season anyway. <laughs> yeah, well, it goes, it goes, it goes a little nuts in the you know, but but that's a you know, you you, you have to kind of give these things credit for like let's swing for the fences, let's do something yeah. that you're not seeing all the time. You know, it's not it's not doing the like, oh look. They're vampires in New York City. Hey, Forever Night, I've seen... I, I see. <laughs> oh, God, Forever Night, holy shit. Man, I kind of want to just stop doing movies and just do, like, 90s sci-fi television series. I think that would be... Oh. The, uh, let's do let's do a year of They Must Be Destroyed on site where we're just going to review old Highlander episodes, Forever oh. Night episodes, <laughs> so wanna... CSV episodes, Farscape episodes, uh, I, Renegade, I wanna... Time Tracks... Oh. Who remembers time tracks except for me? Only me. I remember the name. I don't remember watching it, but goddamn oh, it, I loved that show when I was a kid. <laughs> I, I, I want to forget Forever Night and about ninety percent of the other Made in Canada cheapo TV series that were done in the nineties. Holy shit! But yeah, Daniel, 
Tell the people where they can find you on the interwebs. You can find me on Twitter at Daniel Lee Harper. That's where you can find all my stuff. I do have a Patreon, which unfortunately it does not. I've had a busy couple of weeks, some personal stuff. I do have a hot water heater again. Oh. So everyone everyone should be happy. I can take a hot shower again. So so my Patreon is still fairly empty, but basically I just put it up so that people can pay me to do this. So if you want to give me a buck a month to do this, you can do that at patreon.com slash Daniel Harper. Yeah. And you can find us at tmbdos.podbean.com where you can find our links to YouTube, Apple Podcasts, and our Facebook link, which is, of course, our Facebook group. They must be destroyed on site. Best place to get in touch with us. And not necessarily saying next week, but next episode is going to be our commentary episode on Bright. So uh... I know everyone everyone is chomping at the bit for that, especially to rewatch the film. What I realize belatedly is, or not belatedly, I've realized this for a while, you and I are going to have to rewatch Bright yeah. at least twice, because I'm going to want to rewatch it again before we record. And we're going to record while watching. Well, it, so. I'm, I'm going to be watching Colors Bright uh, at least once be- before we do this. Uh, so yeah. this is going to be a lot more painful for us, and it's going to be for you, the listener. Believe, yeah, believe us. Doesn't even have to watch it again. They can mm. to us talk about it. But uh, yeah, Bright that's going to be a thing. And then after that, we'll be done with our sci-fi series for a while. Yep. And then we're going to do some. Uh, we're going to finally do some Dorothy Malone. Which, uh, yeah. Um, forward to so yeah we're gonna have some fun so uh thank you everyone for listening first first we're gonna watch bright and then we're gonna have some fun (laughs) (laughs) yeah exactly Uh, that that was there was no uh, mistake there that was calculated go 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 give us some money on patreon that's kind of what i would say well yeah give daniel money on patreon i don't have a patreon but so yeah thank you everyone for listening thank you daniel for joining me and we'll be back when we're back with bright woohoo (laughs) Ooh. <laughs>
you for listening to They Must Be Destroyed on Sight. For more episodes, links to our Apple Podcast site, YouTube, and our Facebook group, as well as other websites and podcasts of similar interest, please visit us at tmbtos.podbean.com. Thank you. Drive through. Feel free.